I, I want to move quickly because we have quite a bit of material that I'm excited to share, and there's nothing I'm more excited to share than a legitimate, genuine, worldwide broadcast premiere of a scene from the play Conscience by Don Mullally. Conscience was first performed on Broadway at the Belmont Theater. It ran for 132 performances, opening September 1924. The play moved to Brooklyn's Majestic Theater for a week in March 1925. Then Lillian Foster, who played the female lead role of Madeline in both productions, personally produced, directed, and starred in a London version in autumn of 1929. And as far as I can tell, that's the last time this play was performed for an audience until tonight. Now, reception to conscience was mixed, and that's how I got so drawn to restoring this play in the first place. It sounded like it had some merit, but it was also bonkers and off the wall in the way that I like my classics. For example, there's a review in The Judge from October 11th, 1924. Conscience by Don Mullally is the play in which the husband learns that his wife has been unfaithful to him and chokes her to death. This particular version of the Hoopty Doodle rejoices in a prologue and an epilogue that take the Grand Prix for pompous banality. Unfortunately, however, Mr. Mullally has nothing to say that hasn't been said for the last 100 years. This piece by R. Dana Skinner, syndicated in the Catholic Advance of Wichita, is also typical. This play is more of a sermon than a drama. Conscience narrowly escapes being an important play. Now, in this scene that we are about to perform, itinerant worker and labor organizer Jeff Stewart has his mentor Doc Saunders over for a conversation in the home he shares with his new wife, Madeline. Madeline is a townie who worked at a, as a waitress near a logging camp where Jeff and Doc have blown into town. As the scene opens, Jeff and Saunders are debating a philosophical point while Madeline reads a book nearby. Now, will you explain why a man born in Chicago, educated at Harvard, living in New York on rents collected in Gary, Indiana, is indispensable? As an owner, he is indispensable to a system built on ownership. Ah, that's an evasion. But let it pass. The system built on ownership, is that indispensable? No. <laughs> then your whole theory of the necessary phenomena falls flat. No, it doesn't. Let me illustrate. You admit that some of our ancestors had tails. Naturally. And that the tails were necessary? Of course. In other words, there is nothing unreasonable in nature. If our antediluvian ancestors had tails, there must have been a reason for having tails. Ah, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say that when the reason disappeared, so did the tail. That's uh -huh. elementary. As usual, you are part right and altogether wrong. Which disappeared first, the reason or the tail? Why, every schoolboy knows that when conditions changed, habits changed. And when the tail was no longer needed, it disappeared. Fine, but the tail wasn't argued out of existence or voted out of existence. It wasn't converted to a belief in its own uselessness. It just naturally grew smaller through several thousand years and finally disappeared. I dare say when the great mass of those antediluvians got rid of their tails and felt reasonably sure they wouldn't sprout again, they made it very unpleasant for those who still had them. Say... Say... Now, just a minute. I was just about to say that the present situation is rather similar. When the vast majority of people get rid of their property, which has already happened, and become reasonably sure that they have no chance of getting it back, they will make it very unpleasant for someone. You're both nuts, if you ask me. A reasonably conservative estimate. You two think you are related to monkeys, don't you? Uh, to something resembling a monkey. I shouldn't think of claiming a monkey as a blood relative unless he were present to defend himself. You got most of the stuff you pull out of that book, the mystery of the universe or the riddle of the universe, didn't you? Uh, Heckle did influence my reasoning to a degree. Yeah? Well, I read that one, and it's a lot of bunk. <laughs> when did you read Heckle, baby? One day when I didn't have nothing else to read. I picked it up. Bolsheviki. <laughs> <laughs> Did you understand it all right? I understand enough of it to know it's the bunk. How much of it did you read? A couple pages here and there. Uh, I wish you'd read it all the way through. No, thanks. One nut in the family is plenty. 
<laughs> well, Heckle is a pretty heavy diet for a beginner. Why don't you read some of the other books? I don't have to read them. You shot them at me all day. And anyway, what's the use of reading something you don't know nothing about? If you'd read them, you would know something about them. <laughs> don't make me laugh. You guys read some, and when you get through, you don't know any more about them than I do. You sit up all night fighting about what they mean. Uh, Saunders, what do you do in a case like this? Nothing. I have just said you can't hurry evolution. And if that's meant for a dirty dig, ditto. You're pretty much a monkey yourself. Baby! And you can can the baby. I don't miss much, even if I do look simple. <laughs> Personality should be avoided in a friendly discussion. Let's get back to books. Uh, what are you reading now, Madeline? Three weeks. <laughs> I ask you. At least there is some sense to it. Who wants to read about how much it costs to make shoes and how much somebody don't gets for making them? I don't get any kicks out of that. <laughs> if I remember correctly, Three Weeks is a highly moral book. I don't think it's so bad. Just because a woman's a queen, she might, well, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God love it. Don't. And anyhow, I didn't mean what you thought I did. <laughs> and what did you mean, sweetheart? I was just going to say, well, anyhow, the king told her to, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he gave me a pain in the neck. Oh, let's kiss the pain in the neck and it'll go away. Oh, there. How's that? You two think you're so darn smart and you don't know why any more than anybody else. You talk about things that nobody knows nothing about. This fella, Hector, whatever his name is. Heckle? Yes. He's just guessing at things. He don't really know about them. He wasn't there when they happened. No, but the evidence so far is all in his favor. What evidence? You believe one thing. Somebody else believes something different. How do you know that what you think is right? You don't even know what makes you think, do you? Well, no. No, neither does anybody else. I was reading in the magazine section of the Sunday paper where pretty near half the people on earth believe they think with their stomachs. <laughs> ha, ha, yes, ha. ha, ha. How do you know they ain't right? How do you know you think with your head? Because, my dear, a man may have his stomach removed and for several days at least continue to think but it's a matter of record that not one worthwhile idea originated with a man whose head had been chopped off. Well, I won't argue with you, but I'm entitled to my own opinion. Thank you both. Before we move on, I want to thank several people who have helped make this possible over the past 15 months or so. Uh, former Madison actor Greg Hudson worked with the Billy Rose Theater Division of the New York Public Library to obtain the script from their archives. So I want to thank Greg and the NYPL. I'd also like to thank Jake Penner, Madeline O'Keefe, Jason Summerlot, Zach Bigelow, Laura Kokanowski, and Annie Jay for their earlier participation.